I know that uh, Q in one of the old TNG episodes asks Worf if he's ate any good books recently. And uh, that's kind of like a, a funny joke that people say in Star Trek. But I think Star Trek Picard Clay is going to uh, change that to have you fucked any good androids recently? Because it's a hot, sexy topic that <laughs> your favorite character, Narissa, seems to open up with her brother, who I'm still not really sure whether or not they're blood relatives or anything at this point. But needless to say, Star Trek's grown up and we're all better for it. Yeah, Um my favorite favorite character ever created for Star Trek, Narissa. Um, what else is there to say about her? Very Palpatine esque. Palpatine esque ending, I, falling down an elevator yeah, shaft. Uh, uh, we we can get into it. <laughs> We're going to be talking about Et in Arcadia Ego Part Two. It's the finale for Star Trek Picard. We made it through all ten episodes, and here we are on the other side. So before we get into it, let's listen to some music. All right, so this episode is called Et in Arcadia Ego. It's the second part of the two-parter that wraps up the first season of Star Trek Picard. It's the 10th episode of the first season. First aired on the 26th of March, 2020. Teleplay goes to Michael Shabon. Story credit goes to Michael Shabon and Akiva Goldsman, directed by Akiva Goldsman. In this episode, Picard and his team are pitted against the Romulans and the synthetics of Capellius in a final confrontation. And it all comes to a head, and it all closes. And, um... I get, we were kind of talking on the Discord channel. Uh, if people don't know, we have a Discord thing that we uh, sort of talk about with people who listen to the show. And we were talking about what people's expectations were for the 10th episode, this one, the final season finale. Um, and I kind of I kind of hedged by saying, like, not much would really happen in it. And I kind of feel like I was right. Although at this point, I don't know <laughs> if I'm so skewed that I, I like... I think that big shifts are actually not all that big. But I, I thought... I, I didn't think this was like the worst episode of the season. I thought it was kind of like it landed the plane that it needed to land, and the plane it's missing was, a cu- missing a couple wheels, I think, but probably. But I think the wheels fell off mid air, mid flight, like a couple yeah, hours yeah. back. Like, and it, it, we've been missing the wheels, and we know that we're not going to have them for the landing. So it did as good of a job landing what the story was at that point. So that that's kind of my takeaway, although. This is a series that I find myself like checking my phone frequently while it's on. Yeah. I, I just feel that there's like not a lot of stuff that really grabs me in it, particularly these latest couple episodes. But I, I don't know. I'm also, I'm also just so worn down by this coronavirus and getting ready to move and everything. I don't know if I feel like relief that this is over or something like that. Yeah, I was not looking for even after the last episode. I was not looking forward to this episode because, um. I was not looking forward to it because I was excited to see what happened because honestly, I, I honestly didn't really care. Um, I was excited to see it just because I wanted to see how it ended. And mm-hmm. that was that was it. And uh, <clears throat> I was right about a couple things. Um, the star, the fleet did show up. Yeah. Or at least at least one ship that they then used the clone tool on in Photoshop and just <laughs> control, copied and pasted it a bunch of time. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that showed up. I think I jokingly uh, it, mentioning how ridiculous it would be if Riker showed up captaining one of the ships. Yes, yeah, <laughs> that definitely happened. Uh, and I, I will say overall, this episode had a lot of stuff in it. Not a lot. It had a few things in it that I really liked, but they didn't make any narrative sense. Mm. Like it was all like the Riker thing. I yeah, I got a kick out of seeing Riker flying a a ship and staring down the Romulans. I didn't think it made any sense. Right. Uh, I thought the stuff with, with data at the end was great, but the, um, the, (laughs) the book end of the story that they wedged that into didn't make any sense. Um, you mean, you mean Picard coming back or just talking to data in general? Uh, no, uh, mostly Picard coming back, especially after that whole speech. But, um, yeah, there's a few things that I liked that, that were very uh, insular likes, like in in the in the body of the th- the piece as a whole. It just it didn't make any, a lot of sense, and it yeah. was yeah, I don't know. It was I it was it, it played out almost as 
And I think the reason that I liked those things that they stood out to me so much was because everything else played out like like you were you were reading it off of like a, a Mad Lib sheet, yeah, or something. It just there was nothing inventive about it. It felt. Um, I mean, I I think the biggest strike against it is it, it felt very much like the see uh, the second season finale of Discovery. Like they they just have these finales that build towards this battle sequence Mm -hmm. and it's just like ah but this time they don't shoot at each other (laughs) they shoot at the flowers instead i guess and the flowers get obliterated and ripped to shreds and stuff yeah it's i don't i mean but they they're still building towards that thing and i i guess maybe maybe start off with like something good because i do think that um the data and picard sequence towards the end is probably the best scene the show did its entire run yeah i would agree um, what's funny about it is that once we got to this ending and you see that scene and then you kind of like see everything that goes on after it, uh, it, it's funny to me how it almost feels like the series had a different middle inserted into it. Like the, the, everything <laughs> yeah. that happened from like episodes four to eight or nine felt like you were you were led to believe that all of that was going to be the story and it really wasn't the story at all in a lot of sense like the the mm. Borg cube is almost irrelevant to this series like the the yeah, Romulan yeah. supernova is irrelevant to the series it doesn't matter at all that that happened and yeah, no totally it's 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 just strange like cuz it started off with this idea of being of aging and getting older and everything like that and then it moved into this space storyline where Picard gets off into space and they get the cube and Seven shows up and all that stuff. And then it comes down to this and the final scene with Data almost seems like it's some kind of makeup for his death scene in Nemesis which is funny to me as a fan because I never felt that Data's death scene was bad in nemesis right. like i, I right. think they could have done it better but I, I never felt like it was like oh they need to they need to redo that like that's just that's completely wrong the data went out that way especially if you if you watch the deleted scenes from nemesis the stuff that they took out for some reason which actually explains why data would do that decision in mm-hmm. it, which is a horrible thing that did they did to nemesis but i always felt data's death made sense in that movie and Bringing him back here to kind of redo his death, I don't know. I don't know if it's necessary, but at the same time, it's the only thing in the story that I really liked, which is Data talking about like how the finite nature of life is what makes it right. special. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like, uh, um, it's almost like they redid it because they felt like he didn't get a chance to talk long enough before yeah. he died. And I've seen that in reviews. People were like. I don't like how Data's last word is whispering goodbye. I kind of like that, actually, in Nemesis. But apparently people felt he had much more to say before dying instead of actions. Yeah. No. He's not. I, no. In that situation, that's the way he goes out. It's it's perfectly fine. Uh, but it, it doesn't. It, like, this is so much more of a melodramatic uh, main character death type thing that they do on TV all the time. Where yeah. It's it's weird because you can always tell who's going to die on a TV show because uh, the, that which side character is going to die because that episode they have the most to do. Yep, and it's like it's like they didn't get a chance to do that with Data, so they decided to re, re uh, relitigate his death. But th- yeah, that being said, I thought that stuff was, I thought that was the best stuff in the show, by far. But it's all undercut by this ridiculous thing about picard dying from a natural disease and then being brought back into a robot body for like five more years yeah i like (laughs) i like how they um i would have given picard the exact amount of time that he was designed to live i'd be like you got two days left picard you better make you better make yeah uh, the the rest like what's the I, i i understand the idea of like well we we can't make Patrick Stewart look like he's twenty five, right? Uh, although maybe you can. Either you get Tom Hardy or you use a computer. Yep. But, the um, Irishman guys bring those guys in. Yeah, Euth- to do, euthanize uh, him to do a job that's <laughs> fine. It's fine. Um, but it, it's I. It's just really strange to me to have this big, long, poignant scene about 
the robot who's who's desiring to be human, that's his entire character arc, ultimately coming to the conclusion that in order to complete that journey, he has to die because humans die. Yeah. And then right after that, you bring back your character who did just die, whose whole story has been about finishing his life and saying goodbye to everything. You bring him back in the body of a robot and they don't give him immortal life. They just go, yeah, you'll probably live for like five or 10 more years and then you'll die. And he's yeah. like, oh, thank God. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not like he was poisoned or something. You know what I mean? Right. It's not like yeah. it's not like in the second episode, uh, the Jat Vash slipped him a, a, a slow working poison that was going to kill him uh, by the end of the season. So like he was killed premature, you know, as prematurely as a 94 year old person could be. killed. <laughs> uh, but you know what I mean? It, he just he he died of of a natural occurrence. Yes. He lived his life. Which, yeah. yeah, he lived his life, he completed his mission, and then he died, which is the whole conversation they have. And then they just, well, there's a season two, so we got to put his brain into an android. They got a la- they got a, that landfill android that looks just <laughs> like Picard, so we may as well just call him Picard. <laughs> He's a golem of the uh, Jewish faith. You wanted me to do you a favor? Yes, sir. When you leave... I would be profoundly grateful if you terminated my consciousness. You want to die? Not exactly, sir. I want to live, however briefly, knowing that my life is finite. Mortality gives meaning to human life, Captain. Peace. Love, friendship, these are precious because we know they cannot endure. Butterfly that lives forever. It's really not a butterfly at all. Very well. I will do what you ask. Thank you, sir. Goodbye, Commander. Goodbye, Captain. The, the bigger point to me is funny is that like thematically or on a like a bigger picture level, it, it's kind of a strange statement to make, which is that Data makes this point, which seems to be the thesis of the, the show to this point, is that like the, the, the specialness of something is because it's limited and mm-hmm. trying to expand. So that, join us for season two. Well, it would just join us for this series in general. <laughs> like it's, yeah. it's rebooting something that was finished 20 years ago. Right, right, and right, it, right. it feels like it's like not aware that it is undermining its own point about being limited is, is what makes something special. And so bringing it back and then to do the thing that you're talking about with Picard, which is to resurrect him again, mm. because he has to continue on with this crew to do something. Who, who knows why they're still all hanging out yeah. together, but they're going to continue on. It, it just felt... It felt like it missed the point. And I, I like Data's point because I think there was some talk on the Discord and Twitter as well about like people maybe don't think that Data's point is salient here in Star Trek universe. And I, I disagree because I think that he's making a very secular argument about something. Mm. He's he's yeah, saying definitely. that... What's that? I said, yes, definitely. Oh, I mean, he's he's just saying that like because this is the secular Star Trek universe you don't have this afterlife or something to look forward to. So what makes life special in that case is the fact that it's so finite. And mm. re- religion has a problem with that because religion has the op- where like if you are promised eternal life, then this life can't possibly matter in the grand scheme of things. So what really makes it special in that case? Right. And right. I-, I think that Data's point there is really nice and profound. And it's always charming when Data says things like that because he's an android who doesn't feel emotions about it. So he mm-hmm. he comes to these things and you kind of have to appreciate his rationality, rationality for arriving at it. 
but it's paired against Picard and Patrick Stewart, who's playing a great sort of sorrow role about this. He's playing the human aspect of he's died at this point and he's, he's data who's dead and he's kind of coming to grips with what all of that might mean. And then the, the reverse happens where the light open, the white light appears and he walks towards it, except he brings him back to life instead of being the afterlife. Mm. And it, it all, it all goes away at that point. Yeah. Um, it's an odd, it's a str- you know, I can, I, knowing what I know now about Michael Chabon and his, his connection to Star Trek, you know, through his father and his father had recently passed away, et cetera, et cetera. I don't, I don't mean to et cetera that in a dismissive way, obviously. Right, it's right. That, that was the, the context for him <clears throat> coming into the series was that his father had just passed away pretty yeah. recently. Um, and Star Trek being like a, a bonding element of their relationship. I, I totally, totally get the story. Absolutely. Like it, that. That final uh, bit with Data and Picard seems very heartfeltly written by him. Yeah. And I think it's great. I think it's it's great. I just wish the rest of the show had lived up to that scene and that theme because I, I agree with you. I think that in the middle of the season, it has just got really all over the place. And it's if if you know you're building to this sort of like final scene – I'm surprised that they they weren't able to be more cognizant of 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 the themes that they're working with. Yeah, you know, like why why are you I don't know why are you spending time on the casino planet with seven of nine shooting shooting people when you could be continuing down a the thematic line you're drawing. Well, it's it seems like <clears throat> all of the distractions that it took to get to this point were almost like they were just attempts at world building. And they didn't have anything yeah. to do with the main story whatsoever. And because they were just generally the sense of world building about what's going on, the Romulans and stuff, it they were kind of stuck in a rock and a hard place where they only had 10 episodes to do this. They seemed to want to world build quite drastically, but they also had this theme of Picard uh, getting to the end of his life that they wanted mm-hmm. to finish up on. So when you smash those two together, you end up with world building that doesn't answer enough of the questions that it creates. And then you also shortcut your main story because you don't have time to work with the characters to get to that point because you're, you're so busy talking about Romulan where the Romulan empire is, but you don't have enough time to fully explain what the Romulan empire is doing at this point. You bring in the board cube, but you don't have enough time to explain what's going on on the board cube because these characters have to get to A to B. So you, Mm -hmm. you know, people, people say this was too much story, to tell in 10 episodes. And I I always want to hedge that a little and say, you could tell this story in 10 episodes. They told it poorly over 10 episodes, which is the problem. Like there's no story that you can't tell in 10 episodes. That's 10 hours of TV. Yeah. And they just chose the wrong details to focus on, in my opinion. Yeah. You know, the thing I've been saying is it was too much plot and not enough story. And I think, I think that's what it was. It's just, they, yeah, they, 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 created this story uh you know story bible i assume probably full of all of the world building that they did and they just felt the need to jam it all in there instead of yeah focusing on the uh uh the important details like uh, i mean the the entire thing that kicks everything off the the ban on synthetics they hand wave that in one line of dialogue in the last episode Yes. Where they're it's just very everybody's disco- walking it's very around. Discovery. <laughs> yeah, and then then Soji's like, "Well, I guess I can be part of your team now that the synth ban has been list- lifted." Yeah, Picard hours. winks at her and says, "Me too, baby, me too." Yeah, yeah. twenty four hours after this giant standoff with the fucking Jot Vi, like it, it was. It's a lot of like, it's a lot of that stuff where they had so many <laughs> things in play that they had to balance all these plates. Not only did they have to spin the plates, but they had to figure out how to get them off the sticks without breaking them. I mean, now we're now we're just going to go into the sort of well. The other thing I liked about it, I do like the music on this series. I think the music mm-hmm. is very evocative and very good, and uh, I think that they did an excellent job with the the music. I I have one gripe for music in this episode. Sure, when Riker shows up and he basically tells Commodore O to stand down, or else Starfleet's going to blow the fuck out of them. They like pump in the a, a bit of the Star Trek the TNG theme. Yes, and I was like, if ever there was a misunderstanding of a show, <laughs> you know, <laughs> R- Riker Riker says fire on a Borg cube once, and then the one thing everybody takes away from him on Star Trek is that he was a 
He's a hothead. Gunhead. He was a hothead ready to open up fire for, <laughs> for the sake of the for the Federation. No, that's not that's not that's not how it goes. You play that. You play the TNG theme when Commodore O stands down after they don't fire a right. shot. That's yes, after they that. talk to her. Yeah, yeah. I um I generally don't like the use of the old themes in this series. Every time mm-hmm. Seven appeared, they played the Voyager theme. That was another one. I think they play the Voyager theme after she like front kicks Nerissa off of a balcony. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> you know, I, I think Nerissa is probably a good place to start because oh, it kind of connects the two things that we've been talking about here, which is that Nerissa, the reason Nerissa, I think, is such a terrible villain is that she has really no reason to exist and her entire story right. could have just been combined with O to make O a character who's actually prominent in it. Yep. And mm-hmm. like, Nerissa does not need to be on the cube with Narek. And O could have easily served as the kind of boss of Narek who's telling him what to do and is kind of pushing him hard and not really giving him credit for what he does. Because apparently Narek's whole arc has been that he just wants people to acknowledge that he's doing a good job and he betrays the Romulans because his sister doesn't say good job or whatever the fuck he wants to say yeah. to him. He uh, refers to himself he refers to himself when he's talking to his sister as a Jat Vash washout. Right. So apparently they're not all women, which is, yeah, he just, he's just, he failed to sort of get through yeah. it or something. But what does that even mean? I like it, it doesn't have any bearing on anything because there's no, we don't know enough about them to understand how their like ranking system works. Right. Yes. And it's just, the the this the plot in the series just feels overstuffed with these kind of things. Like Narissa yeah. has no reason to exist in this show. It's O. Well, o O is the entire character that needs to be there along with Narek. Yeah, and I mean I O the I, I laughed out loud when they um the, like right before a commercial break for the first time in the episode and the first time since like the third episode or whatever. They cut to O on the on the helm of the ship, and she says something like, uh, "We will be there soon," or something like yeah. it was just like, "Don't forget, she's here and she's evil." <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, apropos of nothing, and not really understanding what her place in the story is to a certain extent. It's like, oh, she's here and she's the bad guy. Um, but yeah, you easily could have combined her and Narissa. Uh, the Narissa, like, first of all. How did she escape from being torn apart by a bunch of XBs? She got beamed like, out of there. But by, beamed out of there onto what? The Warbirds. How is that possible? Oh, I mean, be- okay. I saw I saw that happen. Like I, I saw the the when they that happened in the episode. I saw the green transporter thing. But she's still on the cube. That's that's true. She's she's still on the board cube. So maybe she. So did she just like she beam herself over to a different row, a I, room I, or something? I guess so. Yeah. Does she never well, I, get off the cube? I guess she never does. I ch- no, because she's been. She's when Narek shows up, she's like, "I've been sneaking around on this cube that is still suspiciously landed right side up somehow." <laughs> and and uh, like the only the only reason she's there, I don't even know what she does in this episode. She just you, they see her like poking around on the computer for something, and then she gets punched off a, off a roof. Yeah, that's the only reason she's there is so she can get punched off a roof. Yeah, it would have been so much more satisfying if the XBs had just torn her to pieces. <laughs> I do. Um, yeah, I would. Have, I'm still very upset about the whole Borg thing here. But I mean, the also sorry, they have seven kill her because she killed Echeb, right? No, she killed Hugh. I don't know. Does she? Does seven know that? Uh, I assume that El. I guess she probably does. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the maybe a bigger point that I think is kind of funny and d- doesn't really work with me is that the uh, the Jat Vash have been uh, their entire existence is based on eliminating artificial intelligence for whatever that means. We've sort of talked mm. about the weakness oh, of defining God, that. Yeah. They they go to this great lengths to wipe out this nest of uh, vipers or whatever they call it, and. Their entire philosophy that drives their way of life, that drives every decision that they make, is undone by an AI acting nice to them, right? And Mm -hmm. where is the logic there where they don't just go, they're only lying to protect themselves, they're still a threat? Like, why why does that convince anybody of anything? Yeah, Yeah, it shouldn't. Absolutely not. It's such a... um, it seems like it's an attempt at sort of like this optimistic TNG outlook on things, but it's just completely not 
grounded in anything that's going on with what you've done for the setup here between this group that is like all consumed by eliminating artificial intelligence Mm -hmm. and then a group of androids who seem perfectly capable about bringing about the end of the existence of like life in the galaxy for some reason yeah it's just a strange uh, i don't know like i I don't buy it i don't i don't understand what the romulan um no point was it's it's absolutely insane to have to create the Jat Vash as this group whose entire drive is the eradication of synthetics because they they saw this universe or ga- galaxy ending premonition about what they could could do and the lengths that they've already done <clears throat> excuse me the lengths that they've already gone to to achieve their goal the Romulans are talking about they've killed people they've uh sent infiltrated Agnes, starfleet yeah infiltrated starfleet sent Gerardi to kill maddox or what like they've they're go they're about to blow up an entire planet and then soji just decides to you know click the off switch for 30 seconds even after even after you see the the giant space tentacle monster <laughs> on its way out of the hole <laughs> Just be, they, she shuts the thing off, and Riker threatens to blow her up, and they're like, "Eh, you know what? Ah, uh, you win some, you lose some. I guess we're going home." You know, <laughs> right, it's like, yeah. th- no, if you, it's if a that's suicide mission on the do. Romulans, like, yeah, it, yeah, it's just it's, a. The Romulans are not going to back down from that situation. It's they would fight and die because of that is the way that they need to stop this threat from happening, and and it seems like the Romulans are right. You know, like this, there's this kind of strange thing that's going on in the philosophy of this show where it's, we talked about it last time, how it's like, it's trying to just say that bad ideas are bad just because Picard says they're bad to people. Mm -hmm. And it really just seems like it's coming across this this kind of like hopelessly naive thing because the Romulans were correct about the, the synths opening up basically... Cthulhu's lair or something mm-hmm. and like calling in the hounds of hell and no one seems to give them any credit for being correct about that. Yeah. No, they were a hundred percent right. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, if they just, j- just to, it's the, uh, if you're, you was that you might be an, you're not wrong. You're just an asshole is basically yeah. the uh, thing to say the Romulans. So. You know, it, and it just, it just goes to show how uh, pointless and, yeah, I guess pointless is the best way to, to to describe that entire plot line and all that stuff because after they shut the thing off, you just had you had the head of security for all of Starfleet revealed as a super secret Romulan agent who was taking a bunch of warbirds to go destroy this planet full of people who are now under the Federation's protection because Picard made a phone call. Yeah. And Riker, Riker backs him down, and then everybody just leaves. Yeah. Like, the, the Romulans just like, hmm, and they just leave, and then Riker's like, well, I guess you can take it from here, John Luke, and then he just fucks off. Yeah. Like, they, they I, I feel like there's some sort of procedure that should be happening here. You'd have um, to lock it down a little bit, you'd assume. A couple at, ships would stay behind. I like that Picard did very not tell least, Riker he was dying. <laughs> Sorry. Right, yeah. At the very least... Have Riker, I would love to have heard him say this, but have have Riker have some dialogue where he's like, Commodore O, something, something, prepare to be boarded. You're being, re- you're being, uh, court martial is, you know, something like that. You yes. know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. That would have, that would have been great dialogue for him. But I mean, it, it would have been like, so is Commodore O, does she get to keep her job? Cause she technically didn't do anything. <laughs> right. <laughs> she was just testing. She goes back into Starfleet. She'll be the, um, J. Jonah Jameson character of season two, basically like, damn you, Picard. I um I hope I, I hope after this is all over, Picard goes back to Admiral McClunky's house or whatever and just goes sheer fucking hubris, huh? <laughs> the I was right. I mean, I'm um that that kind of thing, like the whole forgetting. There's a lot of this stuff you can go through. Like Girardi is apparently just going to get away with murder. In mm-hmm. in this case, like the Romulans. We're just going to kind of forget about that a Romulan agent basically moved up to like one of the highest positions in Starfleet. No one's going to care about that anymore. You know, this is different from Data's Day, which is she was just some sort of ambassador, which requires like, you know, anyone can be an ambassador in the modern day. You just get the assigned the role or whatever. It doesn't seem Mm -hmm. that difficult. But Mm -hmm. O is fairly important in this whole thing. And it's like the, the plot moves so quickly 
you know, in a week from now, when someone asks, like, what, uh, like, if someone hears the podcast and tweets at me or something and says, like, what are some of the things that you think the show left about as, like, unfinished business in a bad sense? I'm going to forget it all because there's so much of it that you just you just yeah. can't hold on to those strings anymore. And as we always say, it's not about it's not about wrapping everything up, but so much of it is just inserted to get something to happen, but it's not really grounded as to why these things are happening in the first place. So you introduce right, something right. and because you need it to sort of kick the rock down the hill, but why the person was at the top of the mountain in the first place doesn't make any sense. So yeah, you're just stuck in this kind of weird position where you never know really what's important or what's going to go on. And then by the end of it, apparently none of it's important because none of it needs to be clarified. Like Gerardi killing Maddox is very strange that no one seems to care about this. She's on the ship with them at the end. So who, who knows what's going to go? And like Narek smiling, we, we don't even see making what out with Narek. the captain. That's right. You know, oh, <laughs> yeah, lot, you, I don't that's even, the horniest ship of all time at the end of oh, this. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah. Apparently seven, seven and Raffi are, are, are getting their freak on too. Which she lost sure. a son, but gained a lesbian lover. Yeah. It's very, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have no idea what happened to Narek. He just disappears after, after his role in the story is over. Yeah. He just, yeah. you know, he's just gone. Um, yeah, it's, it, 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 I mean, not to mention the fact that the entire, the entire conceit of the, of the, the synth argument is that they've created synthetics. They've perfected the technology to the point where they're indistinguishable, indistinguishable from human life and should be treated as such. And then, uh, when Sung finds out the truth about Sutra, he just executes her. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> a- <laughs> I assume maybe he shut her down and had, you know, even so she, he, whether he executes her on the spot or is shutting her off to like reprogram her, I feel like that's 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 a big piece of that argument that from measure of a man is both of those options. That was a terribly directed sequence. Um, the one where Soong shuts her down and then all the other like agents, all the other guys kind of like kick into gear about completing oh, their God. mission. And then they start like karate fighting a bunch of <laughs> super powered androids. <laughs> There's like three people there, not to mention the fact that their whole plan was to blow up the thing with a bag full of grenades, which they hide one inside a soccer ball. And he throws and, it to... And he throws it at Soji. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> I'm just... I, uh... this. That scene to me is, it's awkwardly directed just because, like, the direction is one thing. I think it's very stilted and, like, the kung fu shit is just, like, out of control. But also the the androids don't fight back, really. They're, it's no. like everyone is just kind of like, do the plan. And then you look at Rios is like, I'm going to throw the bomb. And, and you know, Narek is kung fu kicking and Rafi's just standing there. But it's this really uh, non-kinetic action scene it's supposed to i was imagine you're supposed to feel like they're like breaching the gates and they just need to throw this bomb and like that'll be the thing that'll like save the day and all the androids are you know trying to pull them down and like you know, smother them beneath their android bodies or whatever and it just comes across as so inert and so inept in what they were trying to do is it was really distracting yeah it was uh it, it very much stood out as a uh not super well thought out action sequence. Yes, yeah, that's a better way of saying what I what I took along. It just was so poorly designed from a like yeah. a, a blocking and like execution. Well, not standpoint. even that. Not even that. I mean, just like the concept of it just doesn't. I don't know. It just, it feels very like on on what world do you write and then Rios and Rafi and Elrond? What the fuck is it? Elnor. Elnor. Elnor I, called him, I called him Elrond. Yeah. <laughs> Elnor. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Ex- exterior Soong building courtyard. Um, uh, Raf- Rafi, Rios, and uh, Elnor start karate fighting a bunch of super powered uh, synthetic people. <laughs> like what? Like it, it just doesn't make any. It's not a. It's not a great look. It feels very fair, a very stock thing. Yeah, yeah. Same. Same with with Seven and Narissa. It's just. It was a very, you know, a, a fight scene for the sake of a fight scene. Yeah. Yep. No, 100%. Can we talk for a minute about the fucking sonic screwdriver that they gave them in the last episode? Sure. That that can match that the uh, the ocarina from Zelda that that magically fixes the ship and then also magically allows them to uh create holograms of themselves to be fi- what why it's 
that's it's just a ma- it's a piece of magic. It's a it's a magic stick yep. in a Star Trek show used for two to to work their way out of two plot problems. Yes. Well, one one the first one is just to show how it works. It fixes the ship and it just sure. shows you that anything is possible with this thing. And then the second one is they can make copies of themselves to confuse yeah, the Romulans. I just I have such a, a such a huge problem with that. Cuz it's only it's it's comes out of left field and when they introduce it and it they it's introduced in the way that it's like yes it can do literally anything. Yep. Just think and about then, it. Yeah, and then think, they use yeah, it the lantern to, rings basically the green lantern ring. Yeah, it was very similar to a green lantern ring, yes. Um and then they use it in this to cr- create the illusion of a of a a fleet. I don't know, man. That's pretty pretty lame. Yeah. Although they when Gerardi uses it and it makes copies of her face, I did laugh for whatever reason. <laughs> it's, it's a very silly scene. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess it just sticks out of like I don't really even have much of a problem with that stupid thing. Is like it, um, it seems so. Maybe it wasn't a big enough a deal for me in the series to really bother me about it. it it's incredibly clunky, um, and it seems to ex- just exist just to have them. It's kind of a stark contrast with older Star Trek episodes, right? Like the the solution to the problem you think would have been a minor plot story in an old Star Trek episode, right? Like they mm-hmm. have to they have to kind of work on this problem to figure out how they're going to beat the Romulans. But the 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 pacing here doesn't really allow you to have any time to come up with that kind of thing where you have Rios and uh, Raffi working on it. They just have to give her a magic wand that'll accomplish the goal, and it's it's very much a letdown. But it, in some ways, it feels like it's just the uh, it's the prop version of the Soong character in this story. Yeah. Like it's he's just kind of there, and a lot of his scenes are so pointless. He's just like, yeah, I'm just running a test. All right, you need something yeah. <laughs> in the other room. All right, I'll just go fucking dick off to oh, that room. Yeah. I, I've got some thoughts about him, whether or not he's even should be have been in the show at all or or anything would change if you took him out but like, nothing would change he, he does there's no reason to have him other than brent spiner is in the show at yes, that point that yeah. that character is completely useless yeah um that the the uh magic wand thing that creates the multiple illusions of the ships it's not like that even works it works for like 30 seconds mm-hmm and Gives them a, why, a delay until starfleet shows up yeah why waste that time with this magic wand thing why don't you have the Borg cube do something where, you know, it's like, uh, send, uh, patch me in, patch me into the cube and then pulls up seven. And he's like, seven, I need you to buy me some time. You know, something like that, where yeah. it's like the Borg cube manages to shoot a force field around him or something that allows him to give some extra power so he can shoot down some ships or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. something, something using the pieces that are organic to the story and not just introducing a magic wand the episode before so you can do a, a a a plan that doesn't even work. I mean the the seven thing is the and I think this ties it, it, in. okay at, at least there, right? Let's say let's say that happens you use the board cube, the board cube is helping them out somehow, but you know seven's got to you know, keep pushing switches and shit to me. Oh, we're losing power. And then Narissa jump kicks her from the side of the screen or something. <laughs> so then the f- force field goes off from around Picard and now right. he's fucked. Yep. You know? And then, and so then the fight actually makes sense, you know. <clears throat> tying things use the together piece, use the pieces you have guys when you when you're playing when you were a kid and you're playing uh action figures with some with somebody or just anything you're playing a game with someone you establish the rules of your game the kid who was an asshole was always the one who was like no now i can fly you right. know or like no no you can't tag me because i have a force field on it's like there were no force field involved in this yeah this is not that's, that's not how this works moving the goalposts of uh narrative storytelling and playtime all in, all in one move Seven, seven kind of fits into the. I think that that uh, maybe a better way to say this would be like the thing that is to me. We can get probably off of like the specific plot stories, but like more of a. Just uh, to get off of the specific plot stories, because I I do feel that these new Trek shows are kind of an interesting cultural phenomenon where I think I talked about um in the previous episode how I I talked about the uh people not really caring on their new series or whatever like the red letter media guys brought that up and I kind of like threw it out there as a point 
And I think some people mm -hmm. push back on that. And I think I can clarify it. I think that there's, I think that there's a difference between writing a show and maintaining an IP brand, right? So mm -hmm. I think that you can care about your show, but if the main function of that show is to exist as an IP, I think that you relate to it differently than if it was your own show. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So. Sure. It's not that they don't care about it, but I think that the priorities are different from what people would expect if they had sort of a complete autonomy over their show. And just wait to see what Chabon's Showtime series based on his book is going to be like, right? Like mm -hmm. that, he's moving off of Star Trek to do that. And you, I think you'll get a better sense. But like the thing about it that it ties into Picard and maintaining that IP and why I think it's a problem is that the show kind of did the impressive thing in terms of how I view it is that it killed Picard and I didn't particularly care <laughs> about it. Like, Well, part of that, uh, not to cut you off, but I was going to mention that I feel like them announcing that there was going to be a season two before the end of the season was a huge mistake. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually think that I would, I, if this was, if there was no season two, I actually think this episode would improve dramatic. Well, it, it, if Picard had just died at the end of this, mm. I, I would have reconsidered the series. Sure, like I would have sure. recontextualized it. I think a little bit, maybe even gone back and watched it. But because they don't do that, it doesn't really mean anything to me. Like I, I, I think I would have felt more impactful if this was the end of Picard's story, and I kind of would have wanted to see it again to see if I missed anything. Maybe I wouldn't like it, but to undo all that with this season two and to give them this golem body that they spend five minutes explaining the rules about what he can yeah. do. It's just, it, it really, I don't know how you can kill Picard and not make me really feel anything about it. Like that's a pretty impressive accomplishment that this show did. And of course they undo it in five minutes after that by resurrecting him. But still it's the point is, is the point I think. Yeah. I, I, I think it was a mistake to, to say that it was coming back for season two because when you get to that point where Picard is dying, you know, well, eh, he's not going to die because they got a season two to do. Yeah. So he, they're probably going to do something ridiculous, which is what they do. <clears throat> in a resurrection that is on par and ridiculous with uh, Star Trek Into Darkness, I would say. Mm, yeah. I would say, honestly, I hope he gets another shot at dying because I feel like if, if, if we don't see him die on screen, he has about as bad a death sequence as Captain Kirk did. No, I was I was thinking the same thing. Like that, they're both lived up to each other's expectations of having terrible death sequences for each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah I I don't like I it, it is I don't know what what I don't know what season two, I don't know if we want to talk about what season two is, but I mean I couldn't believe there was no cliffhanger or not cliffhanger is not the right i mean maybe it's the right word but like there's no hint strand yeah hint or strand even of what they might do right it's not like the you enterprise know? showing up at discovery uh mm -hmm. the end of the discovery season and then you kind of like oh of course they're going to talk to pike in the next uh, season or whatever yeah it kind of it's kind of in line with the rest of the way the show is set up to me um because it's almost like uh it, it, i feel like the the mo for this show has been there's a lot of stuff going on but it's not stuff we're actually talking about so you're left to speculate about it and somehow people think that makes it a smarter show right so when you get to the end and you don't have any sort of uh hint or or crumb as to what they're going to do next season i'm sure there are people who are going to be like well i mean just think of the things that have are left unaddressed they could go in any direction they want it's yeah like, yeah okay sure you could say that about literally anything. No, that's a, it's an interesting take of this. Like the, the can you the, imagine? Can you imagine what would happen in the in the in the the sequel series to Game of Thrones? I mean, there's so many things that they could pick up on. Literally anything. Yeah, it, it's like, yeah. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean that it's a it's good. <laughs> it's maybe tangential to that, but um, the other counter is that. I think that one thing I would really want to push back on, and I see a lot on social media and kind of responses to what I say on this, is that um, the show is about all of these different things that the episodes talk about. So it's like whatever mm -hmm. whatever the episode is about is kind of like what the series is about. And like 
the show is about things. Uh, you just have to kind of like soak them in or like the, the show mentions something, therefore it's about that thing kind of. Right, right. And th- that's not really a good, that's not really good storytelling. Like the, the, the ser- this series and Discovery suffer from a lack of like theme throughout them. And mm-hmm. what mm-hmm. I think of that counter to the art, like that when people say that to me is like, does that mean you watch uh, or you play Super Mario Brothers and you go, this is a video game about plumbing? It's like, well, no, not really. like it, it, there is there is a plumber in it, but that has like nothing to do with plumbing, right? Like mm-hmm. there's you're not really exploring what it means to be plumbing. So if you were to tell me that the theme of Super Mario is what it's like to be a plumber, it's like, <laughs> no, he he just is a plumber. The the, mm-hmm. the the game is not doing anything about that. Just in the same way that if you tell me that this show or this series and this season is about the aging process, I would argue. They mention the aging process, and fairly effectively in this episode they mention it, but it's it's still just mentioning it. And it doesn't really have anything to do with what the show is talking about or what the show is trying to get its point across. It's, it's not doing a good job of explaining why that is the case and why the series is about those things. Yeah, instead of making the episodes about that and about the exploration of what that means, it just turned it into a, a plot uh, convenience. Yeah. Any any time they needed it, then oh yeah, he's getting old. Oh yeah, he's got a brain thing. Oh yeah, it's the end of the season. Up, oh, I guess he's probably dying. Right. <clears throat> no one listens yeah. to old people. Have someone yell yeah. at him yes. because he's an yeah. old man. Yeah. You know. Um. Speaking of uh, uh, Chabon and h- him writing his next show and everything, and and the failings of this one, I think what it comes down to, honestly, is. Doing the, the writing TV shows is fucking hard, man. Yeah. It's it's real hard, and you clearly they had a lot of stuff that they were excited about. Like I I, I know I I've seen this plenty of times before where it's like you've got so much stuff that you really want to get in there, and so you end up just cramming it in, and you're so excited about all these ideas that they end up getting short shrift because you got so many you want to put in there, and then you. It, by doing that, you lose, and also because they probably they don't write these scripts all at one time. Um, you know, as you get into the season and start doing this stuff, stuff it's it's kind of it's harder to drive that ship once it starts moving. You know, yep. Making um, fixes is much harder once everything is yeah. in motion. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that stuff can get away from you. And there's you you have so many things that you want to put in that you put so many things in that you end up just losing sight of what you were trying to do originally, you know? Yeah. It's, I, I I get it. I'm, I hope, I hope that it's something, uh, I don't want to sound like an asshole saying this. It's not like I've ever done this before, but I hope it's something that he, he has learned from. No, his, did you read his variety interview? I did. I didn't. I read a couple of the clips that were, uh, uh, I assume Kyle posted it because I didn't read it. (laughs) He, he, He talks about, um, I thought it's a good metaphor. He talks about writing for TV as basically an etch a sketch, which is that when you oh, tur- I saw that, yes. when you turn the two dials, you are turning basically plot and characterization. And the hardest thing to do on an etch a sketch is to make a perfectly forty five degree angle line across the x and mm-hmm. the y axis because yeah. you have to turn both at exactly the same time. And he's just saying that like th- that's what he sees as the struggle uh, as to writing a serialized TV story is to have your characterization working as the same as your plot is working. I, I don't know if he thinks this show hit 45 degrees. I think it's a, it's like a three degree line that he's done <laughs> for this. Like there, and it's probably not his fault because discovery runs the same way. Discovery does the same thing. It, it right. seems that there's a, there's a higher up order saying that you have to have more plot in these things. You have to have things churning. You have to have this. Honestly, it doesn't really make any sense to me because they re- release them weekly. So it's not like they're trying to kick off a binge mode type thing where they want mm-hmm. people to churn through these you still have to wait for a week so i don't understand why they constantly have these sort of cliffhanger plot mysteries piled onto it but it it's so consistent with discovery in that regard that i think he was fighting back against something because he has that other telling quote in that variety variety article about his original idea was just picard hanging around in france solving like minor mysteries in town <laughs> and that feels that's more of the character angle on that and it feels like right, he right. he and the rest of the writers are kind of pushed into this for whatever reason this 
new style of storytelling, which is just to bombard people with stuff so that they can't realize what the problems are almost. Yeah. Like uh, we had talked last episode about how it's shocking that for all the talk about uh, synthetics being outlawed and, and there being this big prejudice towards them, not one of the characters has that prejudice. Right. And how he's like, oh, yeah, well, how come Rios? Rios is, makes perfect sense for him to be prejudiced against. I, someone on Twitter responded to that. I can't remember who it is. I'm sorry. Um, by saying, it, instead of Rios, the captain should have been one of the girls from the short trek, which would have made way more sense. Wait, instead the captain? Of being, yeah, because, I mean, 14 years later, you've got this girl. She's, they were like 10 or whatever. Oh, happens, his ca- so Rios' is captain should have become one of those girls. Yeah, instead, instead of Rios. Instead of Rios. No, oh, no, no I not, see what no, you mean. It, I see what you mean. Instead, right, of, right. instead of the character of Rios, the, that character, the captain of the La Serena, should have been the adult version of one of the girls from that short trek sure. about going to school where, you know, and then the Mars thing happens. Because you've got this character that you've already introduced that's got that built into – this, pre- this probable prejudice against uh, synthetics built into it. Yep. But instead of doing something as smooth as that, they got caught up with, oh, what if he's ex Starfleet and he had a captain and they ran into these synthetics and one of them looks exactly like Soji, which doesn't make any sense. And then his <laughs> captain shoots him and then the captain shoots himself in the head because he can't live with it. Like it's, you know, yes. it's, it, that, you get caught up in all of that like intense backstory. Instead of doing the the uh, the smooth character thing that makes sense, we I guess we can get a little bit into that. I was I was thinking about it and uh, how I attempted to streamline the show by combining Narissa and O. Mm-hmm. I think that Elnor and Rios are completely useless characters in this season. Yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. No, Rios. Again, I think it's I think it's a question of interesting stuff, like cool ideas that are not really explored or not given time to explore. So they just end up kind of being there. Well, yeah, for Rios, I thought Rios was set up in such a way with his holographic um, crew that I I felt it was almost like mandatory that they kind of explain him in some way. And they didn't, which is a really strange. Rios felt to me like he was going to become a very important character and the show apparently thought he was just going to be important enough to have seen the earlier Soji version. Like, that was his yeah. entire reason for being there. And that's just not good enough, especially if he is such an unusual characteristic as his holograms. You'd, you'd just expect more. Yeah. And you know, the other thing that occurred to me in this last episode that bothered me a lot, um, and I, I don't know if this is a... Uh, if this is in, not intentional, but anyway, my point is... They're, they're having a I, I, we know that they're doing a season two so as they're coming to the end of this season and this this episode and they do that thing like you know that final shot where everybody's on the bridge of the ship and everything I looked back at the season with a different lens and I I was going wait a minute is this whole season just like one big pilot mm-hmm because that's what it feels like. If you if you know that there's a season two coming, if you look back at the way that all of these characters are put together and not ultimately in, nothing really interesting done with them, it feels like it's all one big pilot to put the crew together on this ship for the f- next season. Right, which is like and, in DS9 where you just have characters like Odo coming and go, no one knows anything about me. Nice to meet yes. you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and that's what this is except drawn out over 10 episodes. Yeah, and by that metric, I was like, "Oh, that makes it even worse," because if if that was what the what they were doing, I I don't know if you can do that consciously over ten episodes and 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 not feel bad about yourself as a writer. Right. But, <laughs> but it just it 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 felt it felt even worse to me because it's like, so in that case, in that case, you're short shrifting on character. Because you're putting all of these characters together and you're focusing on the on the story and the, and the plot, but that doesn't work because the story and the plot and the themes, there's like five different things going on, none of which are really connected, yeah. and they just that sort of falls apart. So then how come you're not – if the plot is just sort of like a bleh, whatever, we'll get there when we get there. You should be spending time on the characters, but they're not really spending time on the characters because they're just doing like weird side missions and stuff that that you're not learning anything about anybody. I thought it's, that- it's just a really weird mishmash of like 
it feels like two different it's like it's like the writer's room maybe you said this last week or the week before it feels like the writer's room had a huge miscommunication about what the show was supposed to be about yeah and one side thought it was supposed to be about theme and one side thought it was supposed to be about plot and they assumed the other guys were going to do it right just they never they never met in the middle unfortunately yeah. do um are you more disappointed in rios or elnor because elnor is my other character that i i really like the concept i i think elnor is the most interesting conception of a character that the show had because in, in a a series in a where a theme seems to be sort of like regret and almost denial about what's coming and like denial about mortality denial of death and all that things elnor was this really interesting character who would come in and just bluntly say things to people about yeah. what they were thinking and you thought that he would sort of open them out of their shells and he kind of does that in this series, but I, I I would argue he does it in almost like unimportant ways to the, to people. Like he he never really uses his power very effectively, but I think the performance is really good because he's kind of fascinating as he's the samurai character that you would say is kind of like a tropey sort of like goofy new age thing that they insert into all these modern shows, but at the same time he's plays himself whenever he's fighting or and, and particularly when he was running from uh, Romulans on the Borg cube he is scared because he his his belief system is just like he just has to portray what he's feeling and he's he was clearly very scared on the Borg cube sure. which is kind of mm-hmm. neat it's neat to have this like samurai fighter character who also is a, almost like terrified as a young kid but he never he just never has these conversations you think that would be the character who conversations with Picard and just gets Picard to sort of like discuss what's going on because of his candor philosophy. Mm. And it, it just mm-hmm. never happened. So I almost feel like Rios is kind of a cool, goofy setup for something. But Elnor felt like he should have been vital to what was going on. And he wasn't by the end of it. No, totally. I think I would say Re- uh, Elnor is probably a better character than Rios. Um, because Rios is entirely built out of... Uh, um, he's not a character. He's just a bunch of like quirks, essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where he's cigar know, chomping, he, cigar chomping. He re- he's another one where it's like, tell me something about his character, not telling me without saying what he looks like or what his job is. Likes philosophy like, and smoking cigars. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah he likes philosophy books and he's got like a weird thing because he's got all these uh, uh, holograms of himself. Um, and I guess he's got PTSD cause his captain killed himself, but it, like, there's nothing, none of that ever amounts to anything. He just ends up playing the role of the guy who drives the car. Yeah. Yeah. And so they, they don't have anything for him to do. So they give him all of this topical, uh, I should say surface level stuff to take the place of him actually ha like all of, again, I, I don't know. I don't mean to keep harping on this, but. All of all of that stuff that they have him do, all of that work they put into giving him these quirks and little eccentricities about it, about everything. None of none of it would be as satisfying as if he was just the guy who hated synthetics. Yep. Because then you have a character that is involved in the story in a meaningful way and has a point of view. You know, he's yep. Yep. chief. He's Chief O'Brien when he's. Dealing uh, with Cardassians, basically. Yeah, yeah. Or, and and gets into arguments with Bashir. You have that element going on. Instead, he's just yeah, he's just he's kind of weird, and he's got a he's got a, a weird robot, not mm-hmm. robot, uh, hologram. He'll <laughs> he'll he'll have sex with you, but he'll also end up in a relationship with you at the same time. So it all yeah, it even all though out. even though you murdered somebody, <laughs> <laughs> it's um yeah, I, I think that that's. It's tough, like, and and obviously, if this is an ex- seen as an extended pilot, maybe we'll get more into characters. Are you, are you looking forward to season two of this show? No, no, <laughs> I, like, I, I don't know what there is to look forward to. Yeah, like you've got, you've kind of, it's kind of difficult to do the age thing again now, right? That you've put him inside of a perfectly fine synthetic body. Mm-hmm. Um. And soon, ca- soon was clear that his his penis works. It, it clearly, yes. <laughs> it clearly works. Everything. How, works. how do you not say? How do you not have him say your body's fully functional? <laughs> um, 
you know, you can't do that. You, there's no clear story unless they do a Borg thing. In no, that case. I, don't, like, do a, they, don't do a Borg thing. I, the, I would be, I would be interested if it was going down the route of what they hinted at in this season of, of the XBs and, and their integration back into society and stuff, but they're obviously not going to do that. Right. Cause it's, 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 it's interesting and not cool enough. Yeah. Uh, there's not, there's not, there's not as much um, opportunity to have 350 ships just stare at each other for five minutes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Like it, there's, uh, unless I, they've kind of exhausted well, I guess they haven't exhausted all their cameos, but like, great. Next season, up oh, here's Worf. Cool, I guess. Yeah. Up, jo- Jordy. He's working as a librarian on what planet? No. Now we're we're just we're running into the the theme of this season. It just flies in the face of that. It's like you you can't keep trotting this stuff out. I I feel fairly negative. Isn't on it, it? Sorry. Isn't it weird? It's just it's just weird overall. To have an entire series or season built around this idea that you're getting old. This is your last go around. This is your last chance to do things right. Your last chance to get behind the wheel of the ship. And also for you to realize, I'm getting too old for this shit. I can't be doing this stuff anymore. Right. And then ending your season with him going like, "Ah, fuck it. Let's go on another adventure. (laughs) I got a brand new body. What the hell? What's the worst that could happen? No, it is. It completely stomps on the theme of what's what's going on there, which is it, it almost. I mean, I said it, but if this, if it just ended with Picard looking back on his life and being like, "Those times were special." Obviously, this is what I'm meant to, what I'm not meant to do. He has this conversation with Data, and that's the end of Picard. I still feel that I don't think that the series would should have the series did not set him up well enough for that to be a a great story really in my eyes mm-hmm. like the you need something better from Picard at the very start of this uh, to make it feel like that's an earned ending but I think that that ending is totally appropriate for the character and I think that that's touching and a good way to go out it's very memorable it gives you the ending to Picard that Nemesis certainly doesn't Nemesis gave you an end to data but you don't really know what's going on with Picard and it feels appropriate and it feels fitting of Patrick Stewart at this point. But to just step back up and say, yeah, Data was wrong. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going back out there. I'm, I'm sorry well, I had to murder Data to get back out there, but I'll murder I, him again. That's one of the things. I don't know if that's what they're saying because it feels like they're not even considering it. Mm. You know, it's like that's the ending we have to have is we have to have him back in the on the bridge saying and engage um regardless of whether or not we have this scene where he were were espousing the uh brevity of life being the thing that makes it most important yeah um yeah it's it's just difficult for me to to reconcile those things moving forward uh unless unless uh season 2 is about uh Riker getting getting to keep his command on that unfortunately <laughs> poorly designed ship <laughs> I, I have to say, after wa- waiting 10 episodes to see the Starfleet ships, I was underwhelmed by them. They're, they they do look like starships. Um, sure. So I will they, give them yeah. that. They do look like an updated version of it. I, it's really depressing that we were laughing about it before we started recording, but he's like, I'm on, the, he's like, Commodore O, I'm on the most powerful starship this side of your fucking Uranus. And, yeah. and she's like, Oh my God. He's like, Yeah, we got 300 of these things. I don't, yeah. <laughs> don't worry you know, about you it. had mentioned, I, I had, I had said, Oh, it's, it's weird that they, all the ships just seemed like, I, I was wondering if using the, uh, uh, magic ocarina to create the illusion of a bunch of copy pasted ships was some sort of in joke to the fact that all of the ships in this episode were just one ship that yeah, they just yeah. copy and pasted. And you had mentioned that there was a um they had just finished the special effects for this like last week. Yeah, that's what I that's what I read. So I I, I could be proven wrong, but what I was reading about it was that the the VFX team was still working on this until last week. And so it seems like they just kind of ran out of gas at that point. And in, in that case, I, what I had said was I in that case I wish that they had only had like two one Maybe two or three Starfleet ships, right? Because then, when when Riker st- Riker shows up with three ships, staring down two hundred and fifty Romulan warbirds, and he's like, "This, you're staring at the most." 
powerful ship that Starfleet has, I suggest you back down. It's kind of like be the way uh, cooler. It's kind of like the dreadnought, the black ship from uh, Into Darkness, the Admiral yeah. ship. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that would have been way cooler. And instead of just like <laughs> we've got we've got seventy inch TVs now, so we can have <laughs> three hundred ships on screen at the same time, and make sure we pull out far enough so we can see all of them, so it just looks like you know like a chessboard seen from about twenty feet away. There's something unintentionally funny to me about the new way that the ships leave and enter warp too, where they just kind of stop mm-hmm. on a dime and then they start and stop. It's like, so so when they leave, they're all just like pew 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 pew, and they, and they yes. all just disappear. <laughs> but when they arrive, it's the opposite. It's just pew 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 pew, and they just stop all in a row. And it, it, I don't really have a problem with it, but when you see it done on like I a do. mass scale, it looks kind of yeah. goofy. I have a problem with it. You have a problem with it. I do because I think the first couple times that they did it. In various sci-fi media, it was very cool. Uh, I don't remember if Star Trek 2009, did they do it that way? I can't remember. I, well, I always, I don't think so. Because they I, do I, it in Star Wars. I know that they started doing that in Star Wars, where like in Rogue One, um, they had all of the uh, rebellion ships pop out of, of warp at the same time. Yes. That was that was super cool. Like, well, you're not expecting it. I don't have a problem with the effect if it feels like the momentum continues at a, at a slower speed. You know, sure. what I, like if they if they come out a super speed and then they're into this sort of normal speed and they're just kind of like coasting along or something, it feels okay. But to have them just come in and kind of stop on a dime, <clears throat> it doesn't. It just doesn't. It doesn't feel aesthetically like all the other Star Trek shows have done, which is when they leave warp, they're usually like curving around something, you know, they're, they're orbiting a planet mm. they're, they're constantly moving. Yeah. Well, my, my issue with it is I think it's, it's, it, they do it so much that it loses its effectiveness. Mm-hmm. And I think it would be much cooler, especially for, you know, a great example of what I'm talking about or what I'm going to talk about is the first Star Wars movie, uh, the original Star Wars, right? One of my favorite little details in that movie, which they've never done again in any other movie, is that Darth Vader's when when Darth Vader and Obi Wan f- come to fight, Obi Wan lights up his lightsaber, normal speed, normal, you know, meow, and there it is, right? Yeah. <laughs> when Darth Vader o- turns his on, it comes out like half speed. <laughs> it's like a very, it's a very dramatic, <laughs> you yeah. know, it's. It's it's cool because he's the bad guy and it's red and it's 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 badass and stuff, and because there's like narrative thought. I at least I assume there's narrative thought being put into how it works and how it's how what what it's giving you um, as a storytelling technique. Yeah, and when they when you do that like the jumping out of light speed thing, everybody does it the same way. It kind of, it all kind of just runs together and feels kind of silly where it's like 250 Romulan things. And then a couple minutes later, 250 Starfleet ships. And now yeah. they're just staring at each other. Yeah. yeah. Like it would be, it would, I would, I would like it if, you know, you're like, okay, the bad guy ships are coming out of warp. But what if we start to see them like one by one appearing or something, or like you could see since the, you've got 300 or 250 ships, all going light speed at the same time. Maybe it looks like a star yeah. that's getting bigger and bigger. You know, something yeah. cool like that instead yeah. of just like, Meh. yeah. No, it's it is just, it's it's just strange that you don't get a lot of the ships and this kind of stuff. It's a little bit disappointing, but we'll see. We'll see what Everybody happens. Everybody comes out of warp like like your dad got pissed off and he's about to turn the car around. <laughs> don't make me turn this thing around, Commodore O. Let's um. <laughs> I guess we'll take a break, and then we'll come back and give our final thoughts about this one, and then we will call it a day. The other sister is called Seb. Seb, you know? Yeah, so we know about her. So you know that she carries a horn from a great pale hell beast called Gamadan. You know when she blows a blast on the horn, it will unleash all the Chahalagu who have been waiting since the beginning of time. You know the sky will crack, and through the crack in the sky, the Chahalagu will come ravening. You know about the thousand days of pain, You know the streets will be slick with entrails of half-devoured corpses. You know the worlds will burn. And the Chahalagu will feast and nurse their brats on blood and pick their teeth with bones. No, we did not know any of that. All right, everybody. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you for supporting the show. If you'd like to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash thepenskefile. It's the best way to do it. 
couple dollars a month and you get extra podcasts. We talked about Data's Day. We revisited an old TNG episode called Data's Day. And it kind of fits uh, appropriately with this Picard season. We've done a few other TNG revisits. We've watched some movies. All those podcasts are available at patreon.com slash the Penske file. Thanks for listening along with this season of Picard. We hope you enjoyed it. If you didn't, let us know why you didn't enjoy it, I suppose. The I think we understand sh- everyone's Picard opinions. Picard or didn't enjoy Picard or didn't enjoy our show? <laughs> Both. Uh, but as always, the Captain Tier supporters get a shout out. Special thanks go to Andrew Sherlock, Ben Douglas, Captain Cork, Cardinal Doomsday, Christian Michaels, Christian Pouch, Darth Mosk, David Beardmore, David K, Dwayne Hackett, Eric Johnson, HH28, Jacob123, Joint Mango, Jordan Cooper, Kevin Reyes, Kyle Barrett, Merritt, Courier 6, Matt Cutler, Matt Ross, Mike Burnett, Nathan Elliott, Neil Brennan, Nick Sergi, Robert Cummins, Russell Ellis, Samuel Custer, Grim Santo, Sean, Stephen Minton, Tark Latif, Tom Howells, Vault 13 Hero, and Will Yates. Thank you very much for supporting the show. It makes everything possible. Um, I think we've talked about our final thoughts really on this one, Clay. I, I, I guess it just on a personal perspective, these new, the, the thing that's annoying to me about not liking these new Star Trek shows, right? Is that, and I mentioned this before, you always kind of just get stuck with these clowns who complain about the show for all the wrong reasons, basically. Yeah, like you, yeah. you get kind of washed up in these idiots who are like either uh, overly obsessed with like technical details or just obsessed with some sort of like bizarre casting thing, or they have some sort of political stance that they think that the show isn't taking seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, I feel like I'm, I feel like it's a lonely place in these shows to have story criticisms because no one else really seems to care about that stuff. And, <laughs> and, and Chabon is kind of the same on his Instagram stories. Like he's doing the same thing that all the other producers did for discovery, which is they're able to dodge hard questions about why is the show doing this by saying, by retweeting basically the clowns and sort of making fun of them. Cause it's easy to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I I just feel frustrated with this new stuff that no one, no one on the production staff, like maybe in 10 years when they release the, you know, the 16K videos of these or whatever, when they get remastered, it'll be behind the scenes Blu-ray commentaries where Chabon's like, yeah, I don't know what the fuck we were doing. Like that was a, that was a real disaster yeah. that we had going on. Unfortunately, that I, unfortunately, I wouldn't count on it. I think those days are over. The, the the commentaries and the uh, the DVDs, obviously. Yeah, all that stuff is just so homogenized now. Like, any time that they do one, it's like, nah, this is just more fluff. Yeah, yeah. That, I, but th- that's the protecting the IP thing, yes, right? Yes, yeah. that's, what I, that's what I was talking about before, and that's what's so discouraging about it. And it's just it's why, a very— Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off again, but, like, that's why we're never going to find out exactly what happened behind the scenes on any of the new Star Wars movies. Right, yes. You got. You got to. We'll pay you to shut up. Basically, like yeah, we're, we're giving yeah. you a lot of money, so you can't feel bad. But you, if you do talk about it, you, you're morally obligated to feel bad. Basically, right? If right. you don't even, if there's not some kind of contract paperwork in place to stop you from talking about things like that. Yeah. Um. It's just, it's kind of a lonely place, and I don't feel these shows don't really give me the fun feeling that even the bad episodes of the sixties and nineties and early two thousands star Trek do like Mm -hmm. there's something just very tiresome about these new Trek shows. And I like, I don't have fun watching them. I'm always bored while they're on. And I don't know, like I'm probably a little bit more down now just because of like the, the state of the coronavirus and everything else and being tired and stuff like that. But it's just, it's not particularly fun. These shows, I think is my, my point. I don't know if you agree or disagree. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, <clears throat> this one in particular, I find to be a difficult one because generally my uh, viewpoint on this stuff, whether it's the new Star Wars movies or if it's the new, if it's Star Trek Discovery or, you know, any sort of rebooting of a of a once loved or property from 30 years ago, whatever, is like, you know, I'm... I'm not the demographic anymore. These are not being, obviously they're trying to get my money for nostalgia reasons, but like they're not making these things for me. Uh, They're making them for other people for the most part. They're trying to get new people into it. The reason that they're, they change the way that they do the Star Trek movies is because they're trying to revitalize it by getting new people into Star Trek. Did I say Star Wars? Yeah, well, you've been talking about both, but I think they both apply. The reason they change the way that they, they do Star Trek 
uh, from from how it was in the '60s and the '90s is because they're tr- that seems old and they're trying to get new people into it, which is totally fine. Yeah, I don't I don't begrudge them that at all. It worked on me with Doctor Who. I couldn't care less about old Doctor Who. I love the new stuff. Um, but this show in particular can't really say that because this is specifically a nostalgia mine. Yes. Which I don't think in and of itself is a bad thing because, you know, it's always I think there's nothing wrong with going back and revisiting characters and stuff like this, you know, a handful of years later. It it can be great. And people are willing um, to pay for it, obviously. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Twin Peaks, Twin Peaks season three was one of the best things I've ever seen on TV in my life. Uh, and I don't think it'll have anything like that will ever be made again. Um. And that was, I don't know who was asking for that, but somehow David Lynch got the money to make 18 hours, 18 hours of material uh, with about 10 hours of people actually doing stuff. Um, But uh, uh, like this one is very much uh, character people. uh, This one is not being put out to necessarily bring in new people. You know what I mean? Like there's not a ton going on here that I think would be attractive to uh, a new audience who's not familiar with Star Trek. I'd love to hear from someone who's, this is their first Star Trek. I I think this show must have been incomprehensible to anyone not familiar with Star Trek. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, that, that makes it difficult for me because this is almost one, I hate to say this because I don't want to be on their side, but this is almost one where you kind of can gripe about that stuff because it's such a, nostalgia mine that the fact that they are it's being made specifically for the people for whom would find this 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 nostalgic yeah but it's not really like doing anything interesting or new with it so it feels kind of like callous and boring right discovery i give a lot more leeway because discovery is clearly like all right we're gonna try and just bring this into the modern era Mm -hmm. and sure totally fine that's a good point doesn't work for me uh, a lot. There's a lot of stuff I do like, though. Like, I wouldn't say I hate Discovery. I don't think it's great uh, quality-wise um, for various writing reasons, but I don't hate it. I think it's I think it's interesting enough to hold my attention and give me a little bit of a Star Trek fix. This one wasn't really doing that except for when they kind of did get into the nostalgia stuff, and it was... Like it's it's a tough it's a tough one to to get through the weeds on because well I agree I feel like there aren't a lot of people who are looking at these things from a more story story based analytical position like we tend to do um there is so much to criticize about the way it was presented for the people who are uh the core audience you know mm-hmm. yeah um and I and I I'm interested. I I am interested. I I I hate saying this, and I I I, I kind of hate it when we say this because it makes it. I don't want it to sound like we think everybody out there are idiots or something. Like, oh, how could you like this? But I I do really. I would really like to hear someone like you were saying talk about this in a positive way. Who is not just blanket? Oh my god, I love everything about it. You know what yeah. I mean. Or they're just liking it because it's Star Trek and these characters, yeah. these characters being on the TV screen is good enough for it's a good enough reason for it to exist. Yeah, and that's the thing too. Like, like I, I couldn't even, I can't even say I like this because it's Star Trek because there's not enough of that stuff in it. Mm-hmm. You well, know, that's the the strange I, thing about your nostalgia trip is that if you are making a show that's a nostalgia trip, you would think that the executives behind the show would be like. Just do it like they used to do it 25 years ago. Like, yeah, update yeah. it, but keep it to be what will not upset that demographic of people you who know, like that stuff. It's the the thing. It just occurred to me now. We were talking about um, in the last couple episodes uh, the 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 problem with the Borg and how they set up this great mechanic of these uh, green things that were flashing. Uh, that were going to signal that the Borg were coming back and they never did it. And it was like, they, ne- you know, I use the, uh, uh, when are we going to get to the fireworks factory ex- uh, expression a lot? This show, I think the motto for this show is um, you think you're going to Disneyland, but you end up going to the dentist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and because it feels like, it feels like what they're doing is they're setting you up 
for this big nostalgia dopamine rush where where in the case of the Borg, it's like, oh, shit. Seven just plugged into the Borg cube. She's ratch. All the Borg are coming back. Oh, my God. This is going to be so great. And then they don't do it. They just suck everybody out into space. But it's not like they replace it with something better. Right. It's not it's not like they get they sidestep what you think is gonna happen and then blow your mind by doing something better that you can like, Oh my god, I can't even I didn't even think about that. And I you know, know it's like, a, I, I know it's a bad example, but it's also not done with something like The Last Jedi's intent. Like I know people don't like The Last Jedi, but I, there's an I, I would argue there's an intent to what Last Jedi is doing that it's embracing that frustrating aspect. And this isn't doing that for any reason other than it would be inconvenient for the show to focus on the Borg uprising for more than 10 Well, minutes. I think using – not to get into a whole discussion about The Last Jedi, but I think the difference is that I think they are doing the same thing except The Last Jedi has uh, the bedrock of the theme that it's going for to kind of like help support those questionable right. the, decisions. Right. The point of the movie is based on all of that happening. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Whereas this is like, it just seems like they're doing it to try and throw you a curveball, but they don't replace it with anything that, you know, it's like trying to throw a curveball, but just like missing the, the ball never curves. Right. It yeah. just goes off to the side. It just, it just hits, brushes, hits the batter in the head. It, yeah. It hits, hits, hits the batter. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean? Because it's so, it's like they're, they're teasing this stuff that's going to give you this nostalgia pop, but then they never, they, they're not following through with it. And they don't give you something better; they replace it with something worse. Right. So it's it, it really leaves you in this weird place where it's like, yeah, I like the idea, but I don't find anything about it satisfying. Right. Like I, and I don't mean I don't need to have. <laughs> let's put it this way: I don't need to have Picard on the bridge of the Enterprise F or whatever, or the Enterprise X. Um, staring down a Borg cube doing whatever I, I could watch Picard do anything. Uh, but since the story they're telling me when he's doing anything, isn't really engaging to me. I, and I would find myself grasping for the star Trek things, right? Yeah. But the star Trek things aren't there. So it's like, well, at least eh, even though the story isn't great, I get to see the new enterprise. I get to see the new, the uniforms. I get to see the, you know, how the new bridge works and stuff like that. You don't get that stuff. So you and I, at least I personally, ended up in this weird gray area where I there wasn't enough story to keep me interested, but there wasn't enough like things I like about Star Trek in it to keep me interested in that way. So I ended up just kind of waiting for it to be over. Yeah, because you're that. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Well, no, you're, you're probably you're you're probably at a weird. Um, your relationship to Star Trek is different than the people who clearly like the stuff just being on TV, you know, and mm. that is, it's not really a negative to them or to you or anything, but it's your, your sense of quote unquote fandom, I suppose, towards the material is just not seeing the, seeing those things is probably not good enough for you. It's just, it's just kind of like the last resort, like break glass in case of emergency situation. Yeah. Like, and, and I think other people are more than willing to just turn the TV on and then break the glass immediately and say, just give me that thing. And that that's good enough for me. And I probably lean towards the, at this point in my life, like what I would want from TV would be some, like I, I would, I'm all for Trek changing and doing something like I'm all mm -hmm. for it trying to kind of modernizing and trying to do this thing. I don't need episodic stories. I don't need like, um, you know, standalone things. I don't need a crew on a ship. But what I do kind of need is that, like, it does have to be a good story. It has to, like, there has to be a, a reason for the show to exist. Yeah, and it's yeah. just not good enough to have these characters in this universe exist in a series that is putting out C minus D plus narrative. It's right. just not good enough to hold me. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And that's not to say that there wasn't good stuff in it, because there was. Good moments in this. Um, I, th I think that this series has better moments than Discovery. Oh, 100%. Yeah. 100%. Yes. Yeah, that's the weird thing. Is like I would... <laughs> With with Discovery, Discovery scratches that Star Trek itch more for me, because I can, at a certain point, I can be like, ugh, whatever. And then I can just get, look at the uniforms and go, man... That Pike's uniform is pretty cool. <laughs> That's a nice or shade like, of yellow oh, yeah. they got there. Yeah, yeah. That Enterprise bridge looks really nice. Is it a good job? Oh, I love the the badges. Those things look great. Like I can I can kind of shut off my mind and just be like, ah, I just love the Star Trek stuff being on TV. Mm -hmm. Um, 
but this one I, I I couldn't do that. But there there were I uh the in this episode specifically. Uh, sorry, I've got mixed up a little bit there. Um, but in Discovery, you don't get those like really satisfying character things. No, because every because no. of the the that's where the write, writing is so lacking. Whereas in Picard, you would get like little glimpses of what this show could have been and the yes. characterization that was like so satisfying. Like in this episode, um. Not just the scene with Data, but that scene with Gerardi where he says something like, uh, uh, was it humanity is a, a responsibility? It's not just a right, it's a responsibility or something like that. Like where he's, he, before they go into their, their final thing, he's got a great little Picard speech he does. Um, and you get bits and pieces of that, but it's so disconnected from everything else that's going on. It's just hard, it's hard to, uh, uh, get excited to watch 40 minutes of bleh just for the hopes that um, Patrick Stewart gets to to perform like a good Picard monologue. Yeah, no, I know. It, it, you didn't feel the, when he sits down in the chair, I think you're supposed to feel that that's a big moment for him. And it, it just, it, it's, it just shows hints of what could have been in that moment. You know, you know what, what bothers me about that again, it's like, it's, it's a, it's a, <laughs> I feel like there's a disconnect of like what would make people respond that way. It, having him sit in the, the chair of the La Serena and you get like a nostalgia feel for him sitting in the, in the, the cockpit of a spaceship is like if he had sat in the driver's seat of like a Ford, a Ford Viper or sorry, a Dodge Viper or something, you know, yeah, it's like, yeah. I don't, I don't consider Picard being a pilot of a ship being the thing that like, Oh, oh man, I, I, he's back in the car. <laughs> You know, it's like, no, you want him when, if he gets onto a Starfleet ship and does that, it's absolutely. More about, it's, yeah. It's not about driving. It's about telling the guy how to drive it, you know? Yeah. 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 And it's like, it's, it's the thing he's known for. It's like Batman. If, if Batman goes 10 episodes without driving the Batmobile and then in the 10th episode, he gets into the DeLorean. I don't go, oh, man, it's so great to see him back behind the wheel of the DeLorean. <laughs> you know, there's... Just back behind, yeah, just back behind, Just seeing this guy pulling the lever is uh, not quite enough for me. Yeah, yeah it's... I, 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 You know, I'm starting to think there's there's a lot of uh, similarities between how this is handled and how Generations is handled, oddly enough. Mm. Because I was, just, I was just thinking, I feel like that miscalculation is is on is on par with the fact that they didn't put Kirk on the Enterprise. Right. Yeah. You know, it's just like it's a it's a layup. I don't know how I don't know how you get Picard onto a Starfleet ship, but it would have been nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's wrap it up there. Thank you guys very much for listening. You can check out patreon.com slash the Pell if you want to support the show. Otherwise you can go to all the social media links that are down below Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, blah blah blah, all that stuff. We'll be, uh, I'll be announcing plans. I'll probably, I'm moving this week, so there won't be a podcast next week. So I'll announce plans for what our next thing is. Let us know what you guys would like to do in the meantime, because discovery has been delayed and that's a good thing in my opinion. Um, well, there will be a, uh, rotten horror picture show next week. There'll be a, oh, that's right. That, so you have a rotten horror, but you won't have a Star Trek coming yep. out. Um, so you check out the rotten horror. Wait for Star Trek. Star Trek will probably be back the week after that. And maybe we'll start something new with Star Trek. I kind of have to cleanse my palate from uh, Picard, but we'll see what it is. And in a couple weeks off, we'll give us some time to decide what we want to do. So let us know what you guys want to hear from the Star Trek podcast in the meantime, before Discovery, or maybe in place of Discovery, convince me. Otherwise, I'll be honest it. with you. I'll be honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we were done with Deep Space Nine, I said that I think I might need a break from Star yep. Trek. Yep. I consider Picard my break from Star Trek. <laughs> I was so um, whatever you want to do, Voyager, Enterprise. Wait, not Voyager because we got to get money to do Voyager. Right, Vo- Voyager would be a condensed version if we were to yeah. do Voyager next. But yeah. yeah, like I, I'm, I'm, I miss Star Trek. You know, classic feeling Star Trek. So yeah, no, I was um. I was just I was flipping through the Instagram and I follow a couple Trek things obviously and um uh there was something it was something about it was Jake uh, Jake and Cisco sort of thing so they put like a bunch of Jake and uh Ben pictures together and I was just flipping through and was like oh yeah I remember <laughs> I, mm. I remember those episodes I was I was very excited I was watching uh, AEW wrestling last night and uh uh 
one of the wrestlers, Cody Rhodes, was in the in the booth with the announcer. And uh, long story short, Star Trek came up, and uh, Cody asked the announcer Tony Schiavone, "He's like, who's your favorite Star Trek captain?" And Tony goes, "Well, Cisco, obviously." Mm-hmm. And and Cody went. Pruh. Cisco is a commander until he got control of the Defiant. He's not even that much of a captain. And I was like, yeah, yeah. They went deep. They went deep. Let us know, guys, what you'd like to hear. Picard has been our break from Star Trek. But I'm, I'm, obviously, some of you really enjoy that show. Let me know why. We'll see about if we want to do another thing where we talk to somebody positive. Let me know if there's anyone out there positive and critical of the show at the same time. Otherwise, hope you guys enjoyed the podcast coverage of Picard. Hope you enjoyed Picard. And we'll be back with more Star Trek, but maybe not next week, maybe two weeks from now. Thanks very much for listening. We'll see you next time.